Good morning, church. It is a privilege and a joy to get to share from the Word of God this morning. Uh, Just a little bit about who I am. Um, I live in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia with my family, my wife and two teenage sons. Uh, We've been living here for uh, 10 to 12 years. Uh, I serve as a seminary lecturer in um, a local seminary here. And then I'm a church planting trainer as well. And then uh, more recently, helping with a small English-speaking congregation here in KL on an interim basis while we uh, seek a longer-term pastor. Um, the, we have, uh, as a family, we have lived in Indonesia as well, uh, mostly in Sumatra. And so we've um, just loved living in this part of the world. And um, yeah, it's a joy to be able to share with you this morning. Let me pray for us, and then we'll jump into our text this morning. Father, we thank you for uh, this opportunity to worship you. Uh, We thank you for the opportunity to open your word and read from it and digest it. Father, I pray that it would be nourishment to our souls. Father, I pray that you would use this um, to continue your work of transformation in our lives. Father, I pray for Uh, this church, that you would use this to bring transformation in the church's life and that you would use um, REC to continue to bring change to Surabaya. Uh, We thank you for your goodness. Uh, We thank you for Jesus who who has made it possible for us to to be talking to you right now. Uh, Father, it's in your name. uh, It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, we're kicking off a missions emphasis month at at REC, and we'll be looking at Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 17. So if you have your Bibles or a Bible app, if you would turn with me to Acts chapter 17, today we'll be looking at verses 14 to 21. This is uh, the beginning of Paul's arrival in the city of Athens. And so we're going to be looking at Paul's time in the city of Athens. This is Paul's second missionary journey, his first one in Europe. So the the church was birthed in Asia, uh, far western Asia. And his first missionary journey was only only went as far as as Asia, and then through a, a vision of a man in Macedonia calling him to cross from Asia into Europe, uh, he get, began in the second journey to share the gospel in Europe for the first time. Before we read this passage, a little background is important. Um, Paul had just gone to two other cities, uh, one of them being Thessalonica and the other being Berea. In Thessalonica, Paul and Silas, I mean, they did what, what they normally did, what, which Paul was Paul's pattern. If there was a synagogue in the city, then he went there and shared the gospel. And that was the case in Thessalonica. And there were a number who came to faith in Jesus, Jews and God-fearing Greeks. However, uh, this soon caused a disruption. There were those who were jealous. Um, There were those that were upset, and they stirred up a mob that went after these new believers. The new believers knew that Paul was in trouble, and so they um, quickly got him out of town. Paul and Silas went to Berea next, and in Berea, they they saw the same thing. There were people that came to faith that were interested, and good things were happening. But then news got back to Thessalonica about what had happened, and they brought trouble to Berea. And again, they had to smuggle Paul out of town. And that's where we pick up on the story. 
So let me read the passage for us this morning, and then we will jump into it. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, What does this babbler wish to say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know more, know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these what these things mean. Now all of the Athenians and the foreigners who live there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. This is the word of the Lord. So this morning let's look at this in three parts. Um, Just quickly they are seeing the idols Uh, Secondly, understand the people. Thirdly, share the truth. So see the idols. When you go into a famous city, what do you do? I think most of us, I'm presuming here, but most of us will go and see the famous buildings. We'll take selfies, try our, the favorite foods of the place, look for souvenirs. We, this is the standard thing for, for tourists in a city. Athens was one of the most famous places visited by Paul. It was the cradle of Greek civilization and well known throughout the Roman Empire as the place where the great philosophers developed their ideas. Think of it, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and Epicurus all originated from Athens. There were large and well-known temples devoted to different gods and goddesses, particularly the goddess Athena. The Romans had allowed the city to be a free city because of its status as a place of learning and influence. Maybe something like Cambridge or Oxford in today's world. Even to enter the city of Athens would have been amazing. There were so many impressive buildings, including the Parthenon with all of its columns going around it on top of a steep hill as you go in. One could understand if Paul was overwhelmed by the city's impressive history and status, but this does not seem to be the case. We, we catch a, a snapshot of Paul as he enters the city of Athens. What did Paul see? Verse 16 tells us that he saw the city was full of idols. Instead of being impressed or amazed or posting on his Instagram, Paul saw the reality of a city full of idols. It says that his spirit was provoked. Other English translations use different terms like disturbed. The Greek word is a strong word. It, 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 he was so upset at the sight that he was staggering. Why was he disturbed to such a degree? Because the city was full of people made in God's image and yet they worshiped gods of human creation. The glory of God Almighty was at stake. How easily we are desensitized to our cities full of false worship. 
I grew up in this part of the world. I grew up in Malaysia primarily. And as far back as I can remember, I had seen temples and other places of worship. I had visited many Chinese temples and Hindu temples. Some were larger and more glamorous than others. When I was in university in the United States, I went on a short-term mission trip to Makassar, at that time known as Ujung Pandan. And in, uh, I went with other university students from America, and I can remember one day we went past a, a small Chinese temple, and my first reaction was, uh, this is a small temple, it's not very impressive. I've seen better. But then someone next to me reacted to the idea that people were offering worship to idols in that temple. It suddenly occurred to me that I had become desensitized to the reality of idols and the worship of idols. The false worship going on did not bother me like it should have. It had just become part of my life. My friend who was disturbed by the sight was rightly disturbed. Paul saw the city through spiritual lenses. He didn't see the city purely as a tourist just taking in the moment. When he saw the idols and temples in every direction, he understood what was happening, that it was robbing God of his due glory. So what about our cities today? Are they full of idols? Yes, there are literal temples and idols in our cities. But we also know that there are so many other objects of worship. There's a, uh, this statue of a bull on Wall Street actually looks like an idol. Yes, finances can be an idol, making money. Our careers can be idols. Sports can be an idol. Pleasure, recreation can be an idol. Fame can be an idol. It's really not a question of are there idols all around us. It's really a matter of identifying the idols around us and identifying the idols within us. What is it that you worship? Maybe without even realizing it. What is the thing that keeps you awake at night? What is the thing that you think about when you wake up in the morning? What is it that makes you happy or sad? Inevitably, anything or anyone we worship other than God will make us sad. Because there's nothing else that can fulfill any of the, the promises or deliver us from our problems or our brokenness other than God himself. Even something good can become an idol in our hearts. So, for example, for parents, our children can consume our ambitions and our worries. What wouldn't we do for the sake of our children? And of course, we are to love and care for our children. Don't hear me wrong. But when it consumes us, it means we've placed too much on that child. And the child cannot deliver all of our hopes and dreams for our child. In fact, it's a burden that the child cannot and should not bear. Idols cannot deliver what they promise. Paul shows a sensitivity to these idols. He shows that people are trapped in their hopes, placed in idols. Because these idols are imposters in reality. 
They are going about pretending to be God when they have no such capability, no such power. Paul does not use this to judge the people around him, but rather it triggers his desire to offer hope in Christ. In other words, his observation of idolatry drives him to mission. Have you looked around your city lately? Do you see it through the, the lenses, to, through spiritual lenses, to see idolatry, to see sin that grieves God? Does it drive you to be a source of hope for the, so many out there? Second point is to understand the people. The whole time Paul is observing the idolatry, he never loses focus on people. The bottom line is he sees an entire city where people's worship is directed at the wrong objects of worship. There is only one worthy of our worship. But Paul is not merely noticing idolatry. He is also learning the mindset of the people. Paul knows that the people of Athens will not hear his message of hope in Christ if he doesn't use ideas that they understand. So we see Paul throw himself into places with people, meeting strangers. And I think that is something that, um, I, I, just to be, to be direct, it's something that Christians have really lost the art of. Uh, we have withdrawn into our Christian circles, and we have lost the art of just opening conversation with others. And I'm not saying that it needs to be some kind of canned speech, but just to having a genuine interest in other people, asking them questions, and drawing that conversation to things of a spiritual nature. Ultimately, Paul's goal is to share the truth with them, which we'll cover in the last point. But it's also, uh, he is actively listening. He's observing. He's taking in information about the people of Athens, what they think and what they believe. So um, a few observations about this. One is people are diverse. I think we, there's a temptation um, particularly in the church, to look outside the church and th just think everyone is similar. Everyone is maybe even opposed to us. People are diverse, especially in cities. People are so diverse. Here in, in Athens, we see diversity even in this short passage there, there were Jews in the synagogue who believed in one God, but had not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. There were temples all around devoted to gods, hoping sacrifices made to these gods would find favor on their lives. Then he references the Stoics and Epicureans. Stoics believed strongly in disciplined morality. They were, they, they were the disciplined ones in society. That one must train themselves to act rightly. Epicureans were, were very different, channeling their purpose through deliberate pursuit of pleasure, which they saw as living as nature guides them. All of them, seeking to gain something through their religious devotion. So that leads to our, our second observation, is that people have beliefs that carry their hopes. Paul understood that people were coming from a variety of backgrounds and beliefs. He spent time observing and learning about them so that he can engage people with the gospel. 
He knows that everyone needs the same gospel. He he also knows that to engage them with the same gospel, they may need different starting points. For example, if you go into the synagogue, then you already have some shared understanding of one God. We share the stories of the Old Testament, even the promises of the Messiah. And so Paul could pretty quickly assume they believed in God and then begin to talk about the promises of the Messiah and how they've been fulfilled in Jesus. However, when he goes to talk to the Stoics and the Epicureans, he he can't assume that they even believe in a God. And so he goes, he has to go to a another starting point with them. But that he can only do that if he spends the time listening, observing, talking to them. So it says in this passage that he goes and he's actively engaged in discussion with them. Daily, it says. He goes and talks to people. It's dialogue. And dialogue has to be two-way. And I think that's something, um, as the church thinks about mission, we need to think about we can't just go and blurt out something. It needs to be a dialogue. We need to listen as much as we tell. The third thing, third observation here is that people will react when their beliefs are challenged. No matter what, to be challenged in what you believe is hard and it is humbling. Most people react badly when that happens. And so that's not a surprise when when those hearing Paul reacted that way. Uh, It says, what does this babbler have to say? Uh, Almost mocking him. And you can you can sense a little bit of the, the pride of a city like Athens. These were people brought up in the probably the best education that there was to offer in the Roman Empire in those days. They were they had argued all kinds of things. They were ready for all the arguments. What seriously can this guy come and have to say that will be intellectually intriguing for us? Of course, remember Paul himself. Uh, reacted really negatively to Christianity at first. He himself was a persecutor of Christians. He himself was was seething in the desire to, to wipe it out completely. And the reality is that, that sometimes the most angry, the most resistant ones, are the ones in whom the Holy Spirit is at work. So just because someone reacts angrily, just because someone maybe uses mockery to make fun of, of, of you, um, and this happens a lot in the workplace. Oh, you still believe that stuff? I used to believe that when I was younger. Um, don't let that get to you. The, the, the truth is the Holy Spirit is at work in people's lives, even those who are mocking. The false beliefs that are that are in us, it's, it's like food poisoning. I don't know if you've had food poisoning. I have, and it is not pretty. And until that food poisoning, that poison in your body, gets out of your body, it creates all kinds of problems. And so we have to understand it's the, the, the mere act of, of sharing hope, sharing good news of Jesus, it is a disruptive process. But it's a healthy disruptive process. It's that process of getting the the food poisoning out and getting the good in. Our last overall point is to share the truth. Paul went to where people were gathered in Athens. The synagogue, 
the market. The market at that time was a place where people went to exchange ideas, hear the latest news or gossip. It's the place where everyone went. Everyone needed food and needed other goods. And so everyone would cross paths there. I don't know what the equivalent is for you. Maybe it still is the, like the wet market early in the morning. Or, or maybe it's social media. Or maybe it's the, the mall on a weekend. Um, but I think the, the calling is for Christians to be where the people are. How do we uh, become, be present where people are, engage in meaningful conversations? Paul had news to share. And so he was desperate to find where people were. If I'm honest with you, you know, after Paul had gone through this rough treatment in Thessalonica and Berea, man, it might have been, if I, if I was Paul, it might have been hard to be motivated to go deliberately to the city center and share the gospel. And especially in Athens. I mean, think about it. I mean, it could have been just easy to be to be nervous being surrounded by these temples and idols and strong beliefs that you just, you, you bail on having those conversations. It could have been easy to be intimidated by the intellect and the philosophers who are well-practiced in arguing ideas. It could have been easy to think, I've had a stressful few weeks Maybe I will just rest up and wait for Silas and Timothy to join me. In the meantime, I'm going to enjoy Athens. Take a few selfies. There you go. So then why did Paul go? Why did Paul deliberately go to the synagogue, go to the market daily? Despite being tired, despite facing many problems, and resistance, he knew something that we sometimes forget. Judgment is coming. And everyone, and I mean everyone, will stand before the Lord, who is the righteous judge. Because you see, the kingdom of God is a good, good kingdom. And this means... Unfortunately for us, there can't be any mixture of bad in God's good kingdom. Paul, in his letter to Christians in Rome, in Romans 3.10, he says, None is righteous. No, not one. None are righteous. Paul tried the route of the Jews which uh, turned out to be um, similar to the Stoics and the Epicureans. He tried to live as morally right as he could. And still he knew his heart was not clean. Jesus entered the world and became for us the perfect sacrifice. So that when we face judgment, It's not our guilty record being presented. Instead, it's the spotless record of Jesus. He died that we might live. Paul sacrificed when he was tired so that others might know this incredible truth of Jesus. When Paul went to each place, he knew that if he stayed quiet, that it would leave thousands upon thousands without hope when they face judgment. Now, I don't know how you're, you're processing this. 
It's possible that you might now be feeling a little bit guilty about not sharing the gospel. That's not my goal. My goal is not to make you feel guilty. Guilty is a passing emotion. If you if all it is is you feel guilty and you go share the gospel a little bit, that feeling will pass. That's not my goal. Paul didn't do this because he felt guilty. He did it because he had been rescued by Jesus. And he wanted many, many more to be rescued. Each time he opened his mouth to share the truth about Jesus, he knew God could use it to rescue more people. And in fact, he already had. Despite the drama and the trauma of being chased out of Thessalonica and Berea, we know that in both places, there were people there who received the good news, who received um, transformation. Their hearts went from hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. They received new life because the gospel changed them. He knew that could happen in Athens. He knew that if he went deliberately to the marketplace, even though he might be scorned or mocked, even though he might be run out of the city, even though he might even be killed for what he has done, as they tried to do on his first missionary journey, he knew that it was worth it. The opportunity to rescue more. So in closing, here are some quick points of application. First of all, to see the idols around you for what they really are. They are robbing God of worship that is due him. Heighten your sensitivity to that reality. What is it that people around you are worshiping? What is it that you yourself are worshiping. Secondly, take time to to understand your neighbors, co-workers, friends. What do they believe? How can you connect them to true hope? Don't just assume that because someone wears a cross around their neck that they believe in Jesus or because they uh, have some other other symbol of their faith about what they believe. Engage them in conversation. Find out uh, where they are, what their hopes are, and what their their brokenness is. Offer them true and real hope in Jesus. Finally, and this is not that different from what I just said, but be deliberate in taking the gospel to those without hope. Don't worry about how clever you you sound or getting everything just right. Give a simple witness to Jesus and let God do the rest. When um one last one last little story, when I was in seminary, I was working in a a small parking lot in a touristy town in California. And I had this man come up. It was a very new agey area. And he, he just gave me his business card. And it had uh, a little website that went to some kind of new age website. And all he said was this. He said, this changed my life. Here, take it. I would love for it to do the same for you. It's all he said. Very simple. Now, I, I of course, it did not, uh, I was not uh, convinced by this website, but the, the point was this. What he said was, was very simple. We can do the same thing with Jesus. We can just put Jesus in front of people. Now, for some people, we might need to give some explanation about who Jesus is. But we can do so simply. How did Jesus change your life? And then from there, 
see where that conversation goes. Let God do the rest of the work. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for this example of Paul. Uh, Though he had been chased out of town, though he had seen the, the ugly face of persecution, though he had dealt with rejection, yet he persisted, yet he continued. We know, God, but that's because you put on his heart and on his lips a message of rescue, of salvation for the world. God, I pray for the members of of REC. God, I pray that you would use each person to give witness to who you are, to offer good news to those who so desperately need it to those that are thirsty, that they might receive living water and never thirst again. Got to pray for the church as um, they think about, maybe even rethink about what mission looks like for their church during this month. Got to pray that you would give them um, wisdom and give them boldness. Got to pray that you would use wreck for your exaltation in Surabaya and to the very ends of the earth. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen. Thank you. It's been a wonderful opportunity to get to share with you. God bless you.